All right, about five seconds. Oh, we're out of time. Pretty awesome packed house. Well, good morning, everybody. Everybody doing good? Uh, we do have a special moment here at the beginning of service. Um, we have a birthday in the house. Avery, one of our interns, turned 20 years old today. Avery, where are you? Wow, she, she left before I started preaching. Oh, no, there she is. Everybody give her a hand. 20 years old. We're so grateful. She's one of our interns. Where were you? Okay. <laughs> That's a good place to be. Oh, you got to love the Church of the Outer Banks. <laughs> well, hey, listen, um, it's good to be here. Uh, for some of you guys that saw on social media, uh, we went this weekend to visit colleges uh, with my, uh, my boy who's a senior. We went to uh, Charlotte and we went to the University of South Carolina and it was super fun. No decisions were made yet, but I do appreciate your prayers because I would like him to stay at COA so he could be close to me. <laughs> he is ready to get out, but so we're, we haven't made a decision yet, so keep praying. But today we're talking, the title of the message as John referred to was Grace That Covers Shame. And last week we talked about shame pretty in-depthly, but I, I didn't feel like we were done. Because shame's a big deal, and thank you so much for all the encouragement from last week's message, the emails and the text messages. This is something that we deal with, and this is something that Jesus wants to heal. And so we're going to be looking again at shame, almost like shame part two. And I know that there's been a lot of people that left last week's services that are, were really thinking about some of the shame that they didn't even know that they were carrying. But let's just take a moment again as a church and as a family to stop in this and let the Lord bring healing to those places. Because if you're anything like me, I carried shame like a yoke for so many years of my life because of some of the family things that had happened to me. And it's when I met Jesus as my father that that yoke got removed. And so I don't know what it is for you. I know what it is for me, but I know that Jesus is here and he wants to heal you of the shame, because sometimes shame is not just what you have done, but as we talked about last week, shame can sometimes be what someone has done to you. So we're going to be talking about this, and we're going to be talking about the Father's heart. We've been talking about the gospel for the last five weeks going into Easter. Um, there's such a misunderstanding of the Father's heart, and unfortunately, as we read God's words, we see time and time again the religious leaders um, and the teachers of that day they had a misunderstanding, a misrepresentation of the Father's heart. And you see Jesus addressing it over and over in parables and stories where they just missed his heart. And, you know, uh, in Jesus' day, there was legalism. These leaders had legalism and self-righteousness and a critical spirit, and they just misrepresented. I mean, I know I'm not the only parent here, but as a parent of five kids and as a father... Doesn't it hurt when you're misrepresented, fathers? Okay, it's just me. <laughs> You've all had kids who misrepresented you before, okay? I have teenagers right now, okay? And some of the things they say, I'm like, gosh, that hurts. And, and, and there's just times where, you know, they'll say things to their friends, and I'm like, wow, is that how you see your dad? And they're like, yup. <laughs> And, I, and it was so funny, you know, it, I, I understand it with teenagers, but I didn't expect it from Arrow. All right, listen to this. So I'm picking up Arrow from preschool, um, you know, and she's all her little friends around her, and she points at me, and I'm so excited to pick her up. She goes, that's my dad, poopy head, butt cheek. <laughs> and they all got around me and laughed and said, poopy head, butt cheek. And I'm like, wow, Arrow, that's what you think of me? Poopy head, butt cheek. <laughs> but we, we've all been there. It hurts. And if you look at the Gospels, it hurts to be misrepresented. They were God's chosen kids. The Jews were his chosen kids that should have understood his heart 
And yet they were the ones that were out there misrepresenting the Father. And so what Jesus did is you read as he comes, he comes and so much of what he's doing is trying to reveal the heart of the Father. And he didn't just come for salvation. He came to correct the misunderstandings of his heart. And so we're talking story after story, and we're looking right directly into who is the Father? What is his heart like? And so that's what we're going to be doing today. Last week, we talked about the woman caught in adultery. Well, today we're talking about the woman at the well. So in John chapter 4, Jesus has this encounter with a Samaritan woman at the well. And we, church, have a front row seat into the Father's heart, into the incredible mercy and grace of God. And we get to learn about the Father, and I've talked about this week after week, that his kindness leads us to repentance. As the scripture says, mercy triumphs over judgment. And remember last week we talked about this. Uh, we know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that what, church? Okay, we'll stop there. <laughs> you know the rest. But do we remember what John 3.17 is? In fact, everyone quotes John 3.16, but what is John 3.17? For go ahead, Chris, your voice is better than mine. I love when Chris speaks about scripture. Chris, could you say it nice and loud? To save the world. Very good. Don't you guys think Chris should have a Bible app? I would listen to it every morning. Chris, we could make a lot of money together. I could be your agent. I love hearing Chris speak the word of God. Okay, I'll say it again. For God so loved the world, God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world. That's much different than what the religious leaders of the day were teaching about the Father's heart. They were teach teaching critical nature, self-righteousness, legalism. There were so many laws, and they were making up new laws. There were something like 660 different laws, and they kept yoking them on people. And these people, they couldn't sustain this yoke. And that's why Jesus says, I come and my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So, so this is where we're at. In this story, you see an incredible amount of shame on this woman's life. It's interesting as we read these stories, you can see yourself in these stories. So the title of my message is Grace That Covers Shame. Let's go, let's go ahead and get in Scripture uh, turn in your Bible to John chapter 4. It's a lot of scripture. I'm going to do my best to read it. It's 30 verses, okay? So you guys start praying for me right now. 30 verses. In fact, if you guys are note takers, this is the longest recorded conversation with Jesus in the entire Gospels. This story is the longest recorded conversation with Jesus in all of scripture. It's worth our, we could probably do a couple parts here, but we, we do have Easter coming up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read. Uh, John chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptized and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. Verse 3. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. That's an important observation right there at noon. We're going to get to that. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Verse 9, The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans, she said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? It's amazing. You can see the signal of shame already on this woman. Who are you talking to me? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift of God that God has for you, you who are speaking to, you would have asked me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water 
than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed. Verse 13, Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Verse 15, Please, sir, the woman said, Give me this water, and then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Jesus says, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands and aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. How about that for an awkward moment? Verse verse 19, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, a time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him for salvation comes through the Jews." But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit. For those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then the disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back into the village telling everyone, come and see a man who had told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. I did it. (laughs) How good is that word? This story is so absolutely powerful, and I don't have the time, church, to get into every little aspect, so I'm going to do the best to teach you the thing that God put upon my heart, and that has to do with shame. So, So you know I love history. I love, love, love history, so I'm going to get to give you a history before we can get into the context to understand what it means. But right from the beginning, you see, out of his way to seek this one lost outcast. And one thing about Christianity, guys, is that this is the difference between religion and Christianity. You see, religion is in a, t- in a man's attempt to get to God. And there's all these rungs that different people are doing, trying to earn favor to God. But Christianity God with us, Emmanuel in the flesh. Christianity is God's attempt to get to man. If you look at the Gospels, it's not religion. Religion is work your way up and I'll earn favor and acceptance for God. And when I blow it, God's mad at me. But when I do good, God loves me. That's not the Gospel. The Gospel is I'm going to meet you in the mud in your sin because that's how much I love you. Even while we were still sinners, Romans says, God died for us. That's the gospel. That's the good news is that he didn't leave you. He comes to where you are. He enters into your sin and your shame to be with you because he loves you. That's the gospel. It's not religion. So let me give you some history. Jesus is on a 70-mile journey north from Jerusalem to Galilee. Uh, Here's a a picture. Well, this is what the scripture says, that he had to go through Samaria. I'm going to be teaching you that uh, no Jews went through Samaria. But he had to go through Samaria. You know why he had to go through Samaria? Because he was on a divine appointment from the Father. Because there was a lost woman that was an outcast that he had to go to to bring the love of God. Amen? Okay, let me keep going. So this, so this is the heart of God that he had to go through Samaria. Uh, some history, uh, Jews had a long hatred towards Samaritans. As some of you know, here's a map. 
Okay, if you look at this map, this is the way that Jesus went. He went right through Samaria. This is the way the early Jews would go. They'd actually cross the Jordan River twice and spend four more days, four more, di- four more miles. They would actually go four more miles to get around these people because they believed these people were cursed. They believed these people were not worthy of the grace of God. This is how far they would go to avoid the area and to avoid the people. Um, historically, there was a long hatred uh, and prejudice for the Samaritan people. In 722 BC, the Assyrians, you guys remember the Assyrians, they came in and they, they sacked the northern kingdom and they took the, all the, 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 the skilled, uh, handsome people and uh, the people who were had amazing jobs and educations, and they took them all, and they, they sent them all away because that's the way that you ruin a culture, and you, and you send them all away into captivity, and they left the poor farmers behind. So during that time, to, to ruin their identity, they bring all these other nations in. They take out the Jews, and they bring all these other people in, and these other people come in, and they intermarry with the Jews, and then what happens is Uh, They break their national identity. And with these foreigners come their foreign gods and their foreign practices and idolatry and immorality, and it breaks the culture. And they actually, it was a war tactic. And so that's what we got here, the Assyrians. And so they uh, they called them a mixed race. Um, They were, um, they were called them half-breeds, Right? Um, I mean, you know, like, it's like uh, when a Carolina fan marries a Duke person, it's a half-breed. Okay, what are their children going to believe? Well, hopefully they're Carolina fans, amen? Sometimes you get Carolina and Duke, and then you get an NC State person, and that's just weird, but I've seen it happen. So they were half-breeds, right? Some of the things that were talked about, about the Samaritans would actually, it kind of makes you sick a little bit. They polluted their faith, and for the Jew, they broke down their identity. These half-breeds brought shame to the faith. The rabbi said that they were in a per- the, the Samaritans were in a perpetual state of impurity and uncleanliness. Like a, I won't even go there. So many strikes against this woman. Strike number one, she was Samaritan. Okay? Strike number two, she was a woman. She was not only a woman, she was a Samaritan woman. The Bible says, verse 7, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. And this is a patriarchal society, as you know. It's actually pretty gross if you, if you really look at the early rabbis. The rabbis, um, for a Jewish rabbi, he was breaking all types of cultural, social, moral, and religious norms. And that's why she's so surprised. She says it in Scripture. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. Why in the world are you talking to me? For rabbis in the time, they didn't even speak. One scholar writes, for a rabbi to speak to a Samaritan woman in public would be the end of his reputation. The famous rabbi of the time, Eliezer, he actually said um, he would rather burn the Torah than to teach it to a woman. Inequality, patriarchal society. In fact, there was a prayer that the rabbis prayed in the morning. Blessed are we, Lord, that you have not made us a woman. And just for the sake of awkwardness, I want you to know I do not believe in any of that. (laughs) And you can tell by my household. How many women do I have in my household? Too many. Just kidding. For the record, I just want to want to take a moment and say this is crazy thinking. Anyone with half a brain will know how much we need a woman. It's uh, I, I saw this in a bathroom one time. It says, "Men to the left, because women are always right." <laughs> oh, and you know that's true too. You know you can clap for that because you know that's true. <laughs> I I reject these Pharisees wholeheartedly. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, you know, another, you know, we need women so bad. I mean, this is kind of funny. This is what being sick looks like in my house. Me, and she's doing everything, and this is a man cold right here. You know what a man cold's like. Look, I'm not the only one, church. Call the doctor. 
Um, my wife still does everything, and I'm in bed thinking I'm going to die. And then there's another meme here. And this is what my dad always taught me. Marriage is a relationship in which one person is always right, and the other is the husband. You can live by this axiom right here. So I just categorically deny all this, uh, all this inequality. But this is the second strike. She's a woman. And in the religious ladder, here, let, let's, get, let's get, in the religious ladder, she's the last person that's qualified for salvation and grace and kindness. There's nothing that this woman can do to climb up high enough to meet the Jews' standard that was a yoke that was against the Father's heart. And this is why Jesus came, church, because they were yoking her. And Jesus said, I have come to unyoke her with freedom. So this is strike number two. So strike number one, she's a Samaritan. Strike number two, she's a woman. And strike number three, she's an immoral outcast. Um, as you look in her story, you will see even her own people rejecting her because she was so immoral. Jesus, Jesus calls it out, and we're going to get there together. He calls it out, yeah, I think it's uh, in, verse, um, in verse 17, where he basically says, you have five husbands and you're living with a boyfriend, truly an outcast. This is her identity. This is the shame that she has carried. Five husbands, and we'll get into, that left her. And the man that she's with now, he doesn't want anything to do with marrying her. This is the yoke that's on this woman's neck. But this is the good news of the gospel church. Jesus came to seek and save all that was lost. And this is where you see grace on display. And this is what the scripture says. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If you're thankful for Jesus, somebody say amen. amen. Because listen, I was sick and you were sick. The Bible talks about it. It's called sin. There was nothing that we could do to earn that. And Jesus says, you know, they can't get to me, so what I'm going to do, I'm coming to them. This is why we meet at church, and this is why we worship. This is why we're grateful. This is why we forgive people. This is why we give. This is why we get up and get our kids, put their clothes on and get them to church, because there's good news. And this is what the world needs to hear. There's not an angry father who's frustrated that just wants you to wallow in your mistakes and just leaves you in the mud. No, he's coming down. He's going to get in the mud with you, and he wants to speak life over you to lift the condemnation and the shame and bring you freedom. And when you taste freedom, all you can do is be thankful for the good news. Amen. Verse 7. So this is powerful. This woman is so beaten. Oh, I could preach forever. I've got like four minutes. No, I, I think I got five. So verse, I'm trying to get you guys out on time. You know, so you, so you guys still love me. Um, there's my acceptance base right there. <laughs> Thank you that Jesus, you love me. Okay, so verse seven. This is so good. The Samaritan woman, uh, she's drawing water at noontime. Say, oh, that's so random. Let me just tell you something about the Bible. Every single jot and tittle is not random. It's all divinely placed in there. It's been through thousand years of persecution where they tried to burn and get rid of the Bible, but yet the word of God remains and stands. It's infallible. It is the word of God, and it was given to you as a love letter that will bless your life. Every single word Theopanustos, God breathed. Not a history book, not a book of principles, the word of God. And it says she was there at noontime. This is very significant, okay? Historically and culturally, a woman in the first century, they drew water early in the morning, okay? Um, uh, and this, this probably makes sense to you. This is practical. Or occasionally at even, evening. Always the first thing for women to do, and at this time right now, there would have been probably... 20 to 30 different women at the well in the morning because they all came at the morning. 
Why, why would they come in the morning? Because they had tasks to do. People had to drink water that day. They had to clean. There was cooking that had to be done. Not to mention, in the middle of the day, it was 90 to 95 degrees. And so... What you see here is this woman is way outside the cultural norm, and she's drawing water about at noontime. And you say, Pastor Jamie, is this a coincidence? Absolutely not. Why is she there at noon? She's all alone. She's there because she's an outcast. Every other woman, respectable woman in the community, they would have been there in the morning with their water jars. Getting their, family, getting their family all ready, wanting to make sure the kids' clothes got all taken care of. But this woman is there at noontime by herself. It's a signal of shame. She's alone in her shame. This is a woman who has been rejected from her own community of Samaritans. And the Jews not only you know, hated them, but now they hate her. So she's an outcast of outcasts sitting there with her water jar at noontime because she is most likely tired of the ridicule, most likely feels like there's a scarlet thread on her, been rejected from all her friends and carrying this million pound weight of failure and shame. Noontime. Jesus confirms it because he calls her out about her shame. This is what Jesus is doing. When you read what he says to her, you think, oh my gosh, that's so cruel. Why would he call her out? No, he's not calling her out to embarrassing her. He's calling her out to reveal her shame. So he says in verse 16, go get your husband. The woman replied, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're with. He calls her out and it seems cruel and unkind, but it's actually beautiful, church, and it's motivated by love, driven by grace. You see, he's naming her shame. Why is he saying this? He's not saying this to condemn her. He's saying, woman, let me tell you what, let me tell you the thing in you that I need to heal, the brokenness in you. It's shame. And, I'm, and I can confirm this. Wait do you hear this. You see, it's very easy here, and most preachers and teachers will give the stereotype of this woman that she's this promiscuous, adulterous, immoral woman, and they'll define her by this. But let me just tell you what the first century culture said. The first century cultural law said that women were not legally allowed to divorce their husband. Did y'all hear me? Women weren't allowed to divorce their husbands. So this flips a script a little bit here. This is a woman that has been left by five different men. Now, maybe some of them died, and maybe there was adultery. I don't know. I can't do too much ice of Jesus, but I can tell you one thing. She wasn't allowed to leave. The men left her. And a lot of scholars would say maybe she was barren. And man after man after man left this woman alone. Shame, rejection, abandonment. And this is a patriarchal culture, so it's all up to the man. In fact, a woman, it even, I was even reading some of the rabbis were saying that um, they would grant them unbelievable reasons. Uh, one of the rabbis said, you can leave a woman if she burnt your food. I ain't going to touch that one, all right? I ain't touching it. Ain't touching it. She's never burnt my food once, <laughs> just so you know. And all I can do is cook grilled cheeses, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> but just think with me, church. Five husbands, they all left her. Imagine the trauma and the shame and the rejection she was carrying. You see, this was her identity. If you missed shame last week, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the message because they go together. But I want to I go back a little bit with you and do some review. Um, shame is a powerfully destructive emotion, and so many carry it as an identity. And I worked with youth group kids for years and years and years. And there's so many of them, and you know, one of the things that signals shame is they can't look you in the eye. 
People are like, why won't you look me in the eye? And for many, many years of my life, I felt like it was just, you know, you're not being respectful. I would listen to their stories, and I would start to realize the reason why they don't look you in the eye is because they feel ashamed. And not always from what they did, but sometimes from some things that have been done to them. They're signals. They're signals of shame. So Brene Brown, she's a, um, uh, she's a, actually, they call her a shame expert. I encourage you to read her book, Daring Greatly. Um, I, I wanted just to tell you that um, she's not completely 100% Christ-centered. She is a Christian, but I have found her work on shame to be incredibly healing and incredibly fruitful. Um, but she talks about shame, and she gives it a definition. Shame is an intensely painful experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. That's what she says. I imagine a crowd this big, I know that there are a plenty of people that have come to church today, and you can relate to this. Where your, that's where your identity becomes. See, there's a difference, church, between guilt and shame, as we talked about last week. See, guilt is action-based, where you say, I did something bad, but shame is much different. It's identity-based, and it actually says, I am bad. And it moves from something you did to becoming something that you believe about yourself. I am bad. I am unlovable. I am worthless. I am unwanted. You ever said any of those things in your life? We feel guilty for what we did, but we feel ashamed of who we are. And this woman, her shame has become her identity. And the enemy loves to allow our past to define us. And if we buy into the lie, we start to believe the things that we did is who we are. And we carry those weights around everywhere we go. And we're like little orphans and we go from one thing to another thing looking for acceptance. But we're carrying this weight. And Jesus says, I want to take the weight. If I'm preaching good, someone say amen. Amen. I don't know what it is for you. I told you last week, and I'm not, I can't get into it because it's a vulnerable place for me. The truth is, is vulnerability actually, vulnerability actually is the thing that can defeat your shame when you're willing to bring it out into the open and say, Jesus, take it from me. I've carried this. And you know what? Even people last week called me and said, Pastor Jamie, I didn't even know that I was carrying shame. Yeah, I didn't either for 19 years. I didn't even know I was carrying shame until I met the Father. So what happens here, uh, all right, I'm, I'm, I've got about two minutes. It's going to be a good two minutes, church. The best two minutes of your life. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to totally under, underperform. Um, so he's, what he's doing here by talking about her husbands, he's exposing the wound. And I want to tell you this, church, the way to experience the grace and mercy of God is through the wound. And we're so good at self-protecting. That's all what our culture does. We, we, you know, we self-medicate, we self-protect, we want to hide. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. You can look at it in Genesis chapter 3. The first thing that happens when they sin, the Bible says they felt naked and felt no shame. It actually uses the word shame. And then sin comes and the first thing they do is what? What do they do, church? They hide and they isolate. And, Jesus, and God has to come back and says, Adam, Eve, where are you? What made you feel like you have to cover yourself? That shame. And Jesus came to take that shame from us. He's saying, bring it to me. We pay so much money and so much energy trying to hide our wounds. And Jesus says, it's through your wounds that you can actually experience the grace of God. There's no shortcuts. And I found that in my life, that he's pulling out the wound because he's saying, woman, if I don't address this issue in your life, you're never going to experience the grace of God. So let him do surgery in your life. It's difficult. 
Sometimes it feels like going to the dentist. I'm sorry, Trey, to say that. It's a bad joke. No one likes to go to the dentist, unless it's Trey. But you've got to go to the dentist to get rid of the infection. So I don't know what it is for you. But I know what it was for me, carrying unworthiness, a lack of acceptance, and a rejection spirit. And let me just tell you, church, it can be like a thousand pound weight on your back. Do you guys know what this is? This is a yoke. I ordered it for last week's sermon. It didn't come in. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to put it in my sermon. I don't care. It was 75 bucks. <laughs> This is a yoke, and if I was athletic right now, I'd put it on my back. I'm going to try. I feel like no momentum right now. Um, okay, it's kind of awkward. So this, this, this is it. I don't know if you've ever tried, you could ever imagine yourself running a race with a yoke around your neck. But I can tell you right now, it's very uncomfortable. I'm going to take it off. <laughs> This is what some of you guys are carrying. And you don't know any different. And you've walked through life and you're like, oh, that's just the way my life is. That's just the way it's got to be. Jesus says, that's not the way it's got to be. You don't have to look downcast. You can look me right in the eyes. I want to set you free. I want you to run a race where you're not entangled by the things in the shame of the world. Jesus says it like this, and this is what I'm going to close with. He says it like this to you, to me, to our church. Come to me. Come to me. All you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my what, church? Take my yoke. He understands the yoke that we carry. Take my yoke upon. Let me teach you, he says. I'm your rabbi because I am humble and gentle at heart, the thing that they weren't teaching the people. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Church, that is the gospel, and if I could get the worship band to come. I want to end with a couple questions. What are you carrying? What have you come here with? What are you carrying? What have you decided? Maybe something that happened to you, and you've let it define your whole life. You see, that's what the enemy is. He's an accuser. And if you let him, he will use that thing that happened to you or that behavior that you had, whether it's financial debt, it's a pornography addiction, or maybe you have committed adultery, or maybe you've just been a lousy parent, or maybe your parents told you you were never good enough. There's so many different things that Jesus wants to heal you of. You're here for a reason today because you've been carrying it for too long. And it's so amazing, if you look at the end of the story, Jesus says, I want to tell you, woman, what you're looking for. He said, she said, I know the Messiah's come. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. And immediately she found what she's looking for. He let her in. He took her shame. And look at what the scripture says happened. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone. What happened there, church? The gospel happened. She was carrying this, this, this water jar and symbolically the Lord took it and she let it go. She dropped it. And I'm sure that day, if she was here to give her testimony, she'd probably say, I felt a 1,000 pounds lighter, and the freedom of Christ came into my life. And all I could do is run back to the village to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. He wants this to be your story. Pastor Colin, if you could come. I'm going to pray for us as we move into the table. Father, I don't know what they're carrying, Lord, but you know what they're carrying. And the Bible says if they would come to me. Jesus says if you will come to me with your water jar and you will give it to me, I will give you rest for your souls. The gospel is today that he wants to take your shame and he wants to give you peace. So Lord, identify the brokenness in our hearts that we may no longer live under the yoke of slavery. Touch those places that we might be alive in Christ. In Jesus' name and God's people said, Church, we are moving to the table. We are moving to the sacraments. We are moving to a place where there is healing. In the name of Jesus, Pastor Colin. Jamie, just before you go, we get into communion. I want to show you something else <clears throat> about the yoke. Because uh, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, as Jamie's taught us. But what happens when we do that is that Jesus walks with us. And so this is what happens. Yeah. <laughs>